Our guest today on NLBTS Conversations is Dr. David Youth. He's the senior pastor of First Baptist Church Orlando. Good to have you. David. Great to be here, Blake. Always good to be with you, man. Well, we appreciate it, and uh, looking forward to asking you some questions. Uh, let's start off with uh, just discuss for us the uh, spiritual life of the pa of the preacher uh, and how the personal spiritual life of the preacher sort of flows over into mm. the pulpit life of the preacher. You know, Blake, I've never been really a good actor. By that I mean I can't have things a wreck at home and then walk into the to the pulpit or walk into church and act like everything's okay. Because the nature of the, the pastor's role and the nature of the preacher's role is his preaching ought to be an outflow of his life. That's when the preaching is at its best, I think, is when it's an outflow of your life. In other words, you're not up there talking about something that's not happening in your life. You, you, you're, it's an outflow, and I don't mean by that it's a therapy session every time you're preaching. But I mean that what you're doing privately and what's happening in your private world is feeding that, that, that message and so it's incredibly important that you guard that, that private life and that personal life in your walk. Because I've always said that as your walk with the Lord goes, so goes your marriage. And I tried to prove that wrong a few times, you know, when I wouldn't be as close to the Lord as I want to be, but I thought I could still stay close to Rachel, my wife, and it not show up. It does show up. So I think in order to really be fair, I would say that the personal life has everything to do with it. And there are a lot of Sundays I go in the pulpit with a bro broken heart over something in the family or just something. You know, we all go through our kids. My kids are, are grown now, and they're all in their 20s now. But there were days when my heart as a father was broken. But rather than letting that work against me, I, I tried to let that really drive me into the Scripture, drive me to the Lord, and keep me on, him, on my knees before Him. Yeah. That's a good thought. I was just, just thinking about what you were saying because I know a lot of ministers, I think every preacher certainly struggles with that at some point. Uh, I'd just like to, to follow up with you there on a question. What do you do when you know there's that pain of whatever's going on? You, you mentioned your children, things like that, but just the life of the pastor, the life of the mm -hmm. minister, things happen. And sometimes, honestly, we just don't feel like, we feel like we need to be preached to rather than preaching. Yeah. So uh, yeah. what are maybe some practical things? I don't know, something that, that you do, I guess, in those moments. I, I, just, I just claim Isaiah's promise that his word will not return void. And I, 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 all of a sudden I go into this mode of, my goal in this moment is to teach this passage of Scripture, is to teach God's word. And because I know his word, remains my life is up and down everything in my world is shaking at the moment but there's one thing that doesn't move and that's his word it is eternal so i try to anchor there and stay there and remember that that's my goal now if i can find appropriateness in sharing a little bit of what's going on in my life that day or that morning then i do because i believe transparency is a is a real key today i, I just think uh professional preachers um uh, are a burden on the church. I really do. And I've prayed against professionalism in my life. I've just said, God, I don't, I don't ever want to be professional. I, it doesn't mean I don't want to be excellent. Yeah. There's a big difference. Professional is when I look at it as a, as a job, as an occupation, and I get really skilled at a, at a craft, and it's disconnected from the living word in me. I think there has to remain a vital connection between the God of then, which we're dealing with in that scripture and teaching in that scripture, and the God of now, which is working in your life and changing your life day by day. That's good stuff. Um, you know, one of the things, I don't know if you know this, but one of the things that you're sort of known for when we, we talk about uh, David Youth is, I know you were here in North Louisiana and now in Orlando, uh, the churches that you pastor have powerful worship services. Uh, I know that's been mentioned uh, on more than one occasion. Uh, talk about just sort of your role in that process as the pastor. What's your role uh, in leading, facilitating worship, and uh, you know before the worship service and during the worship service? Well, I mean that's a that's a, a nice and gracious uh, thought that I would be known for that kind of, uh, of a service because that is my desire. That is something that's very, very dear to me and very important to me. 
and, and primarily because I am a worshiper. I'm a passionate worshiper. And so what happens in that service matters to me because in that context, it makes me and helps me to really deliver the word that God has given me if I'm in a spirit of worship. Um, I've, Blake, I've been convicted about, you know, this, this attitude towards worship that, okay, the singing, y'all do whatever you want and give it to me 30 minutes in. And it's so disconnected. I don't think that honors God. I really don't. I don't think that teaches worship, nor does it honor worship in the way God uh, has given us uh, worship. And worship is a gift. If you read Hebrews 10, you know, it, it cost him a lot to pull that veil open and invite us to come in. Yeah. And, and I just think we need to come with that sense of expectancy, but also a sense of deep gratitude that, that we're not going to take for granted the privilege we get to gather uh, with the assembly of his people and worship him. And so before the service, um, I, I, I spend a lot of time walking through the crowd slowly. I just want to connect. I just want to walk. But then when that service begins, I, I want to be there on the front row worshiping. Yeah. And I've, I've seen so many times in my life in the past where I would be looking over notes. I've seen other pastors while the singing, while the worship is going on, they're looking over notes. Here, here's what I realize. Those people in that room are watching me as the worship leader. If I'm not engaged, if it doesn't matter to me, guess what? It doesn't matter to them. So I have to lead worship. Though I'm not up there on the platform leading the music, they don't want that, but <laughs> I lead worship by the way I worship. And so I think that worship really is to our soul what air is to our, our body. We gotta breathe. We got to breathe. I tell a story. You remember when the whales got trapped up in the Bering Sea and, and they were iced in. And, and of course, whales being uh, mammals and breathing, air breathing, uh, they had to get them to open sea, open water, because their water's going to freeze. And the government spent untold amount of money to drill holes. And they would drill holes every so often so that the whales would move to the next hole, come up for air, then go back under the ice. They drill another hole and they'd come up for air until they got them to the open water. Blake, to me, Sundays are like coming up for air. It's like, deep, it's like taking this deep breath of God with his people. And man, that just fills your soul. And, and I think corporate worship happens best when private worshipers get together. Sunday's not the only day we worship. It's just the day we look forward to gathering with his people as a corporate body worshiping him. So, yeah, worship is incredibly important to me. Yeah, that's good. Remind me of that Tozer quote, if you, if you don't worship God six days, you won't worship God one day. That's exactly right. Well, let, let's switch gears a little bit. I wanted to, to kind of get your thoughts on the International Mission Board. I know you've been serving uh, on the board there. Just kind of talk to us about what's going on with the IMB. I'm sure you're excited about what's happening with the IMB and and, uh, and just, you know, why is the, the ministry of the IMB so important for us as Southern Baptists, particularly as we uh, compare that with, uh, you know, the mission efforts of other denominations? Yeah. It, you know, Blake, for me today, the IMB is on the cutting edge of darkness and lighting it up with the gospel. And those unreached, unengaged people groups now drop below the, the, the 3,000 mark. We, we have a chance in our lifetime to get the gospel to every nation, to every people group, every tribe. And that's pretty cool. And the IMB, that is our task. That is what we're called to do, to facilitate that, to come alongside the churches and help that. So I've been privileged to serve with the IMB uh, for a few years and in the last two years as chairman of the board, which has been a, a whole other level of responsibility. But, but it's the one thing I love doing is serving with the IMB because I get to hear the stories. Yeah. Man, you get to hear these stories of, of lives being changed. And, and, and I'll just share one. Uh, in our last board meeting, uh, one, of our, one of our missionaries from Indonesia was telling us about a, uh, uh, an area where the gospel had gone in and, and this, this chief of this particular uh, village was a very violent man. And they were still headhunters. And so to keep dominance in the area, he would post all the heads, human heads that he had taken 
uh, he would put them when you walk in his hut. So everybody who comes in knows you don't mess with this guy. So, I mean, that was just the kind of man he was. Well, after many years of many heads displayed, he just began to realize that something's wrong and this is not fulfilling me. But he didn't know what it was. And so he began to search and the gospel came through one of our missionaries. And when he heard the gospel, his heart, he, in his testimony, his heart rejoiced and he said, this is it. Wow. Gives his life to Christ. Okay. The pastor, the indigenous pastor, the national pastor there in that area was baptizing him. And people gathered from everywhere because this guy was notorious. When he went under the water, the pastor couldn't get him up. I mean, the guy was under the water and he was staying under the water. And so the pastor's fighting him and the people are now realizing there's a problem. Yeah. Finally, after what seemed forever, he comes up. And the pastor says, are you okay? And he looks and he says, yes. He said, my sins are so great. I just wanted to feel what it was like for them to be all washed away. Wow. And, I mean, you know, as this guy was sharing this in our meeting, oh, my goodness, you know, the, the, the power of the gospel. And we get to hear that every time we get together. And I, I can just tell you that right now there are some unbelievable things happening in the world. And I'll tell you, one of the groups that you don't hear, you're not going to hear it on the news, you're not even going to hear it on Fox News, Muslims are coming to Christ by the thousands. Unbelievable. There's a new book that's just coming out called A Wind in the House of Islam by David Garrison, who is my college roommate. We were in college together, and we, uh, we were roommates back in, uh, back in the day at Weistow Baptist University. And he wrote a book. He interviewed Muslims all over the world. Tell me what happened. Tell me how you came to Christ. And his conclusion, and he tells the stories in this book, his conclusion is there's a fresh wind blowing in the nations. And it's almost as if God has given us this moment. It's a Kairos moment. That we got to seize it. Because you don't know when that window closes. Yeah. So I, I can just tell you, it's, it's an incredible time to be a Southern Baptist because of what we're doing uh, in terms of missions. We have 4,800 roughly um, on the field. And Blake, I think we're the greatest mission sending force in the world. We really are. It's unbelievable. And now what's happening, and this is pretty cool, is I think the IMB has always had this in our heart. We've just never been able to really work it out, I guess, mechanically, and if that's the, the word, we haven't had the mechanism in place. We now can say to a church, hey, you send. We'll just help you. So rather than a church just sending a person to the IMB and then they go somewhere. Yeah. That church says, hey, we have a passion for this unreached, unengaged people group. We've got a person we want to send. The IMB comes alongside. We just sent our first. Really? It was unbelievable. To Madagascar, our people group, there's a, and to more people on the southeast coast of, of Madagascar. And we have a young man who, uh, who got it called, and he was going to go to uh, his native uh, uh, land, uh, Trinidad. And this is what God said to him. Are you going to go back and give people a chance to reject me again? Or will you go to people who've never heard my name? And it was that God turned his heart toward Madagascar because he knew that was our people group. He knew that was our prayer uh, emphasis and what we wanted. And he stepped forward. He went through the process with I and B and us of being vetted and being, you know, all the things you have to do. And so back in January, we stood him in front of our people and laid hands on him and commissioned him and sent him. The IMB is helping us. This was at First Orlando. First Orlando. They're helping us. So what that represents is a little different approach. Whereas before, I would just give his name to the IMB and he would go and they would. Whereas now, we send him directly from our church. He's supported fully by our church. Now... When I say that, that is what we call Global Connect. It allows churches and associations to have that opportunity because some churches aren't able to financially to do that, and we understand that. But, but what this represents, Blake, I think is just another 
door opening to get people to the field. If the goal really is penetrating lostness and getting the gospel to every people group that have little access or no access, then we got to open as many doors as possible. And I'm excited about this door that it represents another string of people going to the field. And uh, so these are these are great days for IMB and Southern Baptist. Great day. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's exciting to hear. You know, your church. You and I were talking about other things your your church is doing as far as ministry initiatives, uh, particularly there in Orlando. Uh, we'll let you out of here on this one. Just tell us about some things that you guys at First Orlando have been doing. Maybe you're you know, you're in the initial stages of, uh, of ministry there in the city. Well, I tell you, we, uh, about two years ago, our church on a weekend, um, without any warning, without any preparation, we had a guest come in, Bruce Wilkinson came in and spoke. He had seen a 60 Minutes program where 60 Minutes came into Orlando and talked about homelessness. And really none of us knew uh, what they exposed in that program. That program aired the Sunday night before he came that next weekend. He called me and said, what, what would you think if I asked your people to do something about homelessness? And what, what, What's your goal? And I said, oh, Bruce, I'd love to be able to give as much to our area as we give abroad. And we give a million dollars. have been giving a million dollars to cooperative program and the Great Commission giving for a while. I said, man, we'd love to do something right there, a million dollars. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask your people to do that. And he said, let's pray about that. And so we prayed, and he called me back two days before we got there, and he said, what do you think God's going to do? And I said, well, I don't know, man. If we get $500,000, i will be thrilled. He said, I think we're going to get a million. He got there, and he preached a message on, uh, uh, it really, it wasn't even on the, I mean, it, it, it was a great message, but it, it wasn't that message. When he asked those people to come and do something, to make a one-year commitment, Blake, they committed $5.7 million to address homelessness in Orlando. My goodness, we couldn't believe it. Yeah. And what came in over the year was 4.9, which was unbelievable in itself. So what that did, that showed me the heart of our church, and it showed me the real hunger of our people to make a difference in our city. So that began what we call Love Orlando. And we are now engaging our, our people in taking a journey of generosity. Meaning, we want you to know the last thing Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. People he loved dearly. The last word he gave them was, remember what Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And we've always thought that was about, you know, giving money. Which it is. But it's so much more. It's about getting involved and giving yourself. And, and so we are inviting our people to go with us on this journey that we think will continue to impact Central Florida in the areas of homelessness, in the, in the areas of, of all the, the needs. I mean, there's so many needs that are just those human needs that we all need. Housing is one, food is one. We have food pantries in the public schools there that we stock so that when a teacher meets a student that's hungry without embarrassment, she can go and get that food and help him out. We do beach clubs in nine different schools. After school, they come, they're mentored, they're tutored, they're, they're taught the scripture. They'll let us teach after school. You know, we have a great time with them. And so we're really trying to ramp up what we're doing. We have a home for women who are getting out of uh, jail and helping them get on their feet again before they go back out in the world. We do a thing called Queen Celebration where we go down on the trail and we bring as many women who are on the streets in prostitution. We bring them to our church campus. We treat them like a queen. That's why we call it a queen celebration. We give them clothing, uh, jewelry, makeovers. Uh, we share the gospel with them. We treat them like a queen. We have a banquet. And, um, and we do that because we're trying to get a message in Orlando that, that we really do care. And I tell you, from anecdotally, one, one uh, year we did it, these two ladies came and they spent all day with us, lives just impacted. And as they were leaving, one of them looked at me and she said, you know what we do? And I said, yeah, I think I know what you do. And she said, you know, we've always known where y'all are because y'all got a really big church down here. We just didn't know you cared for horrors like us. Mm. But now we know. 
One of those ladies has been back every Sunday. She brings people with her. Really? Because that day changed her life. And I thought her statement was so telling. We know where you are. You know, Blake, I don't think the problem is, is that our churches are not known where we are. I just don't think they know who we are. Mm, yeah. They don't know we care. And so for us, that's really the journey we're on, generosity. What does that mean? We're not there just for us. We're there for them. We're there for that community. And if we can uh, take the people with us, I think we're going to have some incredible days ahead. Wow. Well, praise the Lord. Well, David, thanks so much for being here, man, sharing your heart with us. We praise the Lord for what God's doing through you, what He's done through you, what He will continue to do through you. Thanks for, for sharing with us today. Thank we you. appreciate it. Bless you.